Good morning. Welcome again to the Bethany Associate Reformed Presbyterian Church as we gather together today and as we rejoice in the goodness of the Lord Jesus Christ. A few announcements as we begin today, especially for those who are gathered with us here. Uh, there are offering plates on the back uh, pew. Uh, if you didn't put it in when you walked in, uh, just make sure to uh, put it in when you leave. And again, I will put the uh, online uh, giving link on the video uh, when it's uploaded uh, to YouTube. And if you will, uh, also as a reminder, uh, you can also mail uh, offerings to the church. And uh, other announcements I have for you this morning. Uh, please uh, continue to be in prayer uh, for Susan Gordon, uh, who's in the hospital, and also uh, continue to be in prayer for all of uh, God's people. And let us begin our time of worship today in a moment of silent prayer. Amen. Our call to worship this morning comes to us from the 13th chapter of Paul's uh, first letter to the church at Corinth. Again, as we turn to the Lord our God today, on the day that he has made and declared holy, let us hear the very word of the living and the true God. From 1 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 4. Hear the word of the Lord. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy, love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believe all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. And as we come together today rejoicing in the reality that the Lord Jesus Christ has come in power and in glory. I invite you now to stand as we come and as we sing from God's Word this morning uh, from Bible Song number 195, a call to joyous worship. Let us stand and let us rejoice together.
give thanks that the Lord our God who has had mercy and grace unto his covenant children, who has watched over us even in the midst of our rebellion, and brought us back into his covenant family through the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us come now before the Lord our God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you who are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you are the God who has given unto us such a beautiful testimony of your mercy. And dear God, we pray this morning as we come together in the name of Jesus Christ, as we come together praising that name, which has granted unto us not only new life in himself, but has granted unto us the very keys of heaven. God, we pray through the power of your Holy Spirit that you will give us a remembrance of your grace and that you will encourage us in the peace of your goodness, that we might go forth in this place, even this day, rejoicing in your name and showing forth our praise in our lips, in our hearts, and in our minds, that in all things that we do, that we might have love for you and we might have love for our neighbor. And dear God, we gather now, saying the words your Son taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Forgive us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us turn in our Bible song this morning to Bible song number, um, <clears throat> to our scripture reading, I should say, to Luke chapter 12, as we continue to read in God's word today from Luke 12, uh, beginning at verse 35. Let us go there to Luke 12, beginning at verse 35, as we hear the very word of the living and the true God, once more uh, from the New Testament and the gospel of Luke. Again, Luke 12, beginning there at verse 35. Hear the word of the Lord. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master when he comes will find watching. Assuredly I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if he should come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. Then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us or to all people? And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household, to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given, and from him much will be required, and to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. Amen. As we give thanks for the reading of God's holy word, we respond in praise for the name of the Lord our God by turning once more to our Bible song, Bible song number 122, our dependence on God for salvation. Let us stand as we sing the word of our God. Again, Bible song 122.
you to be seated as we come before uh, the great gift that God has given to us, the opportunity to bring the needs of our hearts and our lives before him in prayer. Again, let us prepare ourselves. Let us pray. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of holiness and righteousness, the God of peace and the God of comfort, dear God, unto you we gather this morning. We come together in our homes. We come uh, together throughout of this world with that same faith, that same baptism, that same promise applied unto our hearts and upon our souls, that you are the one who has made the eternal promise unto your saints. You are the one who has guaranteed our place in the eternal kingdom. And dear God, as we come before you as sinners, as those who have fallen short of your glory, as those who have uh, come uh, within uh, the grips of the evil one. Dear God, we come before you as weak vessels. Dear God, we pray in your mercy uh, that as you had mercy on uh, Israel in the wilderness, that you will have mercy upon us. Dear God, that you will have mercy upon us, not because of who we are or who our parents are or who uh, the, the, the church belong to is, but because of who we are in Jesus Christ, that we wear his garment upon our shoulders, that we uh, bear his sign upon our heads. And dear God, we confess that when you look upon us, you see not our transgressions, but you see the very face of your son. And dear God, we confess that it's far too often in life that we take for granted how wonderful this reality is that our identity is not in sin but that our identity is in the Lamb of God who bears our names upon his heart who carries that book of life wherever he goes and that no one, no power no evil thing can ever snatch it out of his hands and dear God may we find peace and comfort in these truths Especially, dear God, as we come before you confessing our sins, as we come before you as our Heavenly Father, knowing that we deserve your wrath. But you, you have grabbed us by the scruff of our necks and you have lifted us up off the ground. You have embraced us as your own. God, we pray in your mercy and in your grace, dear God, that we would live in light of this great and wonderful blessing. Dear God, that we would obey your law out of thanksgiving for your grace. Dear God, that we would meditate upon your word, that it would be the very song of our hearts. Dear God, we see in your word that the faithful ones are those who knew you deeply, who knew your word better than any piece of information that this world can provide. God, we pray that you would encourage us through the power of your Holy Spirit again to, uh, to make your word our bread and to make the blood and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ to be our drink. And that the words of Christ may dwell within us richly and that we may know you in a better and in a deeper way each and every day. To God, as we pray for these particular things this morning, to God, we continue to ask uh, for your power to be upon those who are, are losing grip uh, with your grace at this time. Uh, those who are, are wandering away from the faith. Uh, those who have uh, been snatched in the midst of this dark time. God, we earnestly pray for their souls. And God, we earnestly pray that 
uh, you, by your grace, would bring them back into the fold. But dear God, that they would be convicted of their sin as they wander. Dear God, as the prodigal son would return back unto the house that they have wandered away from. And dear God, that we might receive them with the same joy and the same rejoicing that the Father gave to His Son. Dear God, we pray in Your mercy, dear God, that You would be powerful at this time and in this day, uh, that uh, though we may be in troubling times, dear God, that Your Gospel is being uh, uh, brought forth in many areas and in many ways that previously it had not uh, been able to penetrate. Dear God, we pray for the seeds that have been planted uh, through uh, Your means. God, for we know that all things are done in accordance with your glory and for your purposes. And dear God, especially in this day uh, in which we face this great trial, this trial of your judgment that has been brought down upon the world for its transgressions. God, we see so many times in history that, that when there are these times of judgment, dear God, not only does your church come out the other side uh, cleaner, and with the dross uh, burned away. But dear God, we see again in the evidence of your providence that out of the darkness shines forth the light of your truth. Dear God, we pray especially during this time that, uh, that, that as you use us for your glory, dear God, that you uh, would encourage us uh, through your Holy Spirit. Dear God, we especially continue to lift up unto you the doctors and nurses and uh, healthcare professionals, dear God, who are working uh, so diligently, who are working uh, in, in many cases with, uh, with uh, strings attached and, and with other uh, matters keeping them uh, from uh, their duties. And dear God, we pray uh, in your mercy and in your wisdom uh, that, uh, that, that all of our medical professionals will be able to do uh, their work uh, in uh, fullness God, we give thanks again for the many sacrifices that have been made uh, by our medical professionals. To God, we ask that you would strengthen them not only in body, but most especially in spirit and in heart. God, we give thanks uh, this morning uh, for the work of, uh, of, of Samaritan's Purse and for uh, the labors that they have brought, especially in New York City. To God, we ask that your mercy would be with them, especially as they are receiving uh, attacks from the evil one. God, we pray that their witness will be bold at this time. God, we pray in your mercy that as uh, we continue uh, to fight against this particular plague, dear God, that you would grant wisdom unto government officials, dear God, as they make decisions. God, we pray that you would guide them uh, with uh, the best uh, truth and knowledge. Dear God, that they would not fear what man has to say, dear God, but that you would remind them of their duty uh, to be a nursing mother and a foster father to the nation. And we pray for them as they face, again, many challenges and, and in many voices. God, may you give them clarity of thought and may you give them your purpose in their labors. And God, we pray in your mercy as we continue to walk this path. God, we know that each one of us is facing particular trials. God, we lift up those particular trials unto you, dear God. We pray for each of our individual concerns and worries. Dear God, we know that you are powerful enough to hear our prayers and to answer our prayers. Dear God, as we continue to worship you this morning, dear God, as we continue to serve you in the days to come, dear God, we continue to ask your mercy and your blessings to be in our hearts, to be in our souls, and to be at our fingertips. God, as we serve you in all that we do, and in Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us now stand as we go once more uh, to uh, the word of the living God. We turn to our sermon text today uh, from Isaiah 54, uh, verses 1 through 3. Again, let us turn uh, to these words of Holy Scripture. Again, Isaiah chapter 54, beginning at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud, you who have not labored with child. For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. 
Enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left and your descendants shall inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, you've given to us these words on this day. Dear God, we pray through your power that you will apply uh, the words of your truth unto our hearts. That, dear God, we might live lives not only of understanding, but of love. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. One of the things that's very true is that in our day, it's very easy to be pessimistic about the future of the church. It's very easy to look with the eyes of flesh onto the world around us and see the poverty of spirit, to see the, the, the almost the wildfire of sin and wickedness spreading over the nations and over the world. And we hear reports almost daily of God's people uh, being persecuted for their faith. It seems like every time a new poll comes out in the United States, that church attendance is down, faith as some kind of amorphous thing is down, people are being more open in their denial of the reality of God. And again, that's what the polls tell us. And again, it's very easy for us to read those articles and, and see those stories posted to Facebook and Twitter and, and, and other places and lose hope and think, well, maybe we're in the end times. Maybe we're in the days of the great apostasy. Maybe Jesus is coming back soon. And certainly there is some truth to that. We are living in a day of great apostasy, especially within the church. We are living in a day where fewer and fewer people are confessing Christ as Lord. And we are living in a time where the church is facing more and more persecution. One of the things that we need to always remind ourselves is that history doesn't begin the day we're born. This isn't the first time that we've seen apostasy grow in the world. It's not even the first time that we've seen a worldwide persecution of the church. And it's certainly not the first time that we've seen the numbers of God's people be almost minuscule in comparison to the nations and the world around it. One of the passages that comes to mind in this regard is the days of the prophet Elijah. You remember that Elijah, after he had won the great victory at Mount Carmel, was almost immediately drawn into depression. He was drawn into sadness of heart. And it, it seemed to be somewhat of a strange story because, again, it goes from the heights of Mount Carmel, seeing the power of God come down upon the enemies of the gospel, and immediately Ahab and Jezebel go after him. And he again is drawn down by that. He is uh, brought to a dark night of the soul, as it were. And he cries out unto the Lord. And, and, and thinking that he is the only man in all of Israel who believes in Jehovah. And God kind of chastises him there. And, and reminds him, be of good cheer, Elijah. There are 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And of course, we read that story at first, we think, we do the math in our head, and we're like, wait a minute, 7,000 versus how many people are in Israel? I don't know, a million, two million, five million in Israel? And God's telling Elijah to lift his spirits because there are 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee to Baal. And again, with, with eyes of flesh, we read that and we think, boy, that's awful strange. Yet, what do the scriptures tell us about what the end of things will look like? And it's very important for us 
to always read the scriptures with eyes of faith. To read the scriptures with what the Bible has told us will be the reality of things at the end of days. And it, it, it's very much a part of the nature of the church today and to be pessimistic about the world around us and especially about the future of the church. But remember what Jesus told the disciples. Remember what Jesus told the disciples in the so-called kingdom parables, especially in Matthew 13. And what's one of the ones we love to teach the children? Right, the parable of the mustard seed. And what does the parable of the mustard seed teach us? Right, this, this seed, this insignificant little tiny seed, right, what's it going to grow into? One of the biggest of all trees. Right, all these animals are going to come and live in the mustard tree. They're going to be protected by it. You, you think of uh, you know, similar uh, stories in the Bible, and we go to the book of Daniel. And in Daniel chapter 2, we have this vision, or Nebuchadnezzar, I should say, has the vision, uh, but we read of the vision, of this giant statue, right? The statue is made of different materials. And you remember the feet, what were they made of? They made of clay, right? And what happens at the end of the vision? Well, a mountain comes out of the earth and crushes the feet of this statue. And what does the mountain do? Does it stop when it crushes the feet? No, the mountain continues to grow, continues to blossom, continues to, until it's bigger than anything that's even possible to imagine. And this is what the passage that we have before us is wanting us to consider. Again, is our understanding of the future bound by what our eyes see? Or is our understanding of the future bounded by what the Word of God has told us concerning Christ's kingdom? One of the things that we need to bring into our own hearts and our minds is the fact that the King of Kings is not going to limp into glory a defeated emperor with a small remnant trailing behind him. How do we see the King of Kings in the book of Revelation? And we see him on the great white horse with King of Kings on his side, throwing all of the enemies of God into the lake of fire. All those who allied themselves with Antichrist thrown into destruction. Remember what it says about the kingdom of Christ in the book of Revelation in Revelation chapter 7. What does it say about the kingdom? That out of every tribe and every tongue, every nation, every color, every creed of man will come a nation that is without number. A nation that is greater than anything that we can possibly imagine. And of course, when John is writing what he is receiving from the Lord Jesus Christ, that's not a new revelation. Remember what God had promised Abram. Did God tell Abram, well, out of you is going to come this small little remnant and it's always going to be this small little remnant and you're just going to have to make do with what I give. All right, is that, is that the message of Genesis 12? Is that the message of Genesis 17? No, what God tells Abram is that out of him will come a seed and what else will come out of him? All right, a multitude of nations. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear that language of multiple nations, and I hear that language of a nation which is more than the sands of the seashore, I'm not thinking of a small amount of people. You go to any beach on the planet Earth, and I want you to spend some time counting the sand on the seashore. Now, how long do you think it would take you to count all the sand at Myrtle Beach? Let's take a smaller beach. Let's, let, let's, let's go a little further south. And go to Hunting, Hunting Island and, and go to the beach there and, uh, and go, go and you know, count the sand in that beach. How long do you think that would take? Right. Do you think you'd ever get to the bottom of the sand, even in a small little sandbar? Well, the answer, of course, is no. And what's the other image we see in the scriptures of the promise made to Abraham? Right, that the stars in the sky will be the number of his children. Again, one of the blessings of growing up in the middle of nowhere in West Virginia was is there was very little uh, you know, light pollution. 
And you could go outside at night and you could see stars from hilltop to hilltop. You could see the clarity of the Milky Way. Now, any of y'all have ever been out west, you know, out in the desert in the west, and have seen the array of stars in the sky, it, 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 it's just breathtaking. The incomprehensibility of the number of stars in the sky. So again, what is the, the, the reality of our understanding of the kingdom of God? Again, is it bounded by the eyes of flesh or is it bounded by the eyes of Scripture? Looking at our Scripture passage today in Isaiah 54, we are having a response to the work of the servant of Isaiah 53. Right, Isaiah 53 is the, the, the beautiful passage, this New Testament gospel passage of Isaiah 53, which speaks of the victory of Jesus Christ over sin, the victory of Jesus Christ over the kingdom of death, the victory over Satan himself. And listen to what it says in verse 12. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Again, these are words of great peace and comfort unto the Christian. Again, sometimes the... Uh, chapter divisions in the Bible do us a disservice because they tell us to kind of change our thinking for a moment. It's almost like, well, verse 12 has ended. Well, what's next? Well, again, we have to always remember that our Bible didn't come to us in this way. We need to read it you know, as the story continues. Well, what's the response to this great and wonderful work of salvation, this redemptive work of Jesus Christ who has died for sinners and brought them into his kingdom? And verse 1 says, Sing, O barren, who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. You have not labored with child, for more are the children of desolate than the children of the married woman. Now again, I, I, I'm not a math whiz, but when the Bible tells us that more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman, what's that equation supposed to look like? The equation is supposed to say there's more of this than there are of that. Well, think about what, again, it's telling us here about the nature of Christ's work and how we are to understand the nature of his kingdom and of his church. Well, again, who are we in this equation? Are we the children of the desolate or are we the children of the married woman? Well, again, it's important to remember that you know, one of the blessings we have of living on this side of the cross is that the New Testament has clarified this for us. And we are told exactly how this applies in Galatians chapter 4. Right? When we think of the language of the bondwoman and the free woman, and the language there of uh, the way in which uh, Paul there will describe the two sons of Abraham. Right? We, we think of the, the work that is, that is promised there. Again, the desolate, right? Think about who that describes. Who are the desolate in the Bible? Right? We're the desolate. Right? We who were outside of the covenant family of God, we who were dead in sin, we who were barren, who brought forth no good works, no good fruit, who brought nothing but our own sin to the table. Right? Doesn't that describe who we are? We are the desolate. We have no good within us, as Paul tells us in Romans 3, as he quotes from the Old Testament. And so we who are desolate, what are we supposed to do? Well, remember what it says here. Again, sing, O barren, who have not born. Right? The barren are to sing. And why are they to sing? For more are the children of the desolate than the children of the married woman. Again, this, this promise that we have here in Isaiah 54 is part and parcel of what we are to think of when we apply passages in the New Testament, for instance, like the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Again, we have a message to send unto the nations. We have a message to send to the desolate that they are to sing. And why are they to sing? 
Because Jesus Christ is dead for them. Because Jesus Christ has died for their sins. Now again, think about something else that's going on in this passage. If you are an Israelite and you're hearing the prophet say these words, well think back to what the Bible has to tell us about barren women. You think of, you know, especially when we think of Abraham, who do you think of? Think of Sarah, right? What are we told of Sarah? Right? That she was unable to have children, that she was barren, that she had not born any. But what happens to Sarah? Right? Sarah bears a child. And what do we know of Sarah? She bears a child named Isaac. And what does Isaac end up with? Right? He ends up with children. What does Isaac? What does Jacob end up with? Remember, he has also a wife who is barren. Right? Rachel is barren, and the Lord provides a child for Rachel. And then after Rachel, who do we have? We have Manoah's wife, who likewise in the book of Judges receives a child. And I invite you to go and read that passage because it's it's one of the most clear testimonies of the gospel in the whole of the Old Testament. Because Manoah's wife is visited by someone. And of course, if, if you're paying attention, who is she visited by? She's visited by the, by the pre-incarnate Christ who provides for her a child. And it's interesting to see that in the midst, of course, what happens to Jesus. We think later in the book of 1 Samuel of Hannah. Right? Hannah, a barren woman, receives a child. And what does Hannah testify concerning her barrenness? And she gives this son to the Lord to be a servant of the Lord. Again, all of these stories in the Old Testament and then at the beginning of the New Testament with Elizabeth are testifying to us again of the nature of the work of the gospel in the hearts of unbelievers. Right? Because who opens the womb? Right? Do, do doctors open the womb? Right? Does science open the womb? No. The Lord Jesus Christ, of course, opens the womb. Right? That is God's power to do. And if we think about that, of course, in the context of salvation, has any of us come to faith by our own power? Has any of us come to a knowledge of the truth because we woke up one day and decided that Jesus made more sense than Allah? Or that Jesus made more sense than materialism and idolatry? Now, of course, what has happened to all of us is that God Almighty has sent the Holy Spirit to regenerate us through the blood of Jesus Christ, through the application of redemption unto our hearts. And we think of the way in which God describes this in the book of Ezekiel, right? Our hearts of stone are replaced with hearts of flesh. And we think again of this barrenness and why is it that we sin? Isaiah 54, sing, O barren, you who have not born, break forth into singing and cry aloud, for you have not labored with child, for more of the children are the desolate than the children of the married woman, says the Lord. And it's important to notice what follows this rejoicing, what follows this worship, what follows this thanksgiving for the great and wonderful work of God who has given children to the barren. It says there in verse 2, enlarge the place of your tent and let them stretch out the curtains of your dwellings. Do not spare, lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you shall expand to the right and to the left and your descendants will inherit the nations and make the desolate cities inhabited. Again, this, this word that's going out to the barren woman, what is she told to do by the Lord? She's told to enlarge the place of your tent. Now think about this word picture here. What would be the purpose of enlarging your tent? Again, if you, know, you have a house with two bedrooms and you have three children or four children or five children, eventually it's going to get too small. And what are you going to have to do? Right? You have to build another bedroom or move into a bigger house. Well, think about the day in which Isaiah is living. What did you do to make your house bigger? Especially if you are a wanderer. Well, you just made the tent big, right? Now, who usually was in charge of that? Well, it was the woman who was usually in charge of ensuring that the tent 
could handle all those who were living in it. And the Lord is telling this barren woman, this woman without child, to expand the size of her tent. And notice again something else he says about this expansion of the tent. He says, you shall expand it to the right and to the left. Right? There, there's no ending to how big this tent is going to be. You can use your imagination, barren woman. It's going to be immense in size. You know, when we think about the calling of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, and this is where it goes back to this idea whether we should walk by faith or by sight. Again, we live in this present evil world. We live in this time where we look with our eyes and see the wickedness around us. But what do the promises of God tell us? The promises of God tell us that we are to expand our tents. That we who are barren will be made the fathers and mothers of an innumerable nation. Again, this gets back to the, the, the willingness we have, again, to profess the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do we believe that the gospel has power? Do we believe that men and women come under the conviction of sin to the preaching of the gospel? And is it something we believe in our hearts and in our souls and in our minds? Or is it something we just kind of believe on paper? We kind of say, well, of course we believe the gospel has power. But do we actually live as those who believe that it has power? Again, this is what Isaiah is asking us this morning. Again, as a church, do we believe that men and women come to faith through Jesus Christ? Do we believe that the gospel has the power to convict sinners? And this is a question we have to ask ourselves as we go out and as we preach the good news of Christ. Again, do you think that Peter and Paul believed that the gospel had power when they went out into their missionary journeys? Well, why else would they have faced the rocks and the stones of their enemies? But again, think about where the church was centuries after Paul and Peter took the rocks of their enemies. Who eventually won in the Roman Empire? Right? Did the gods of Rome win or did the Lord Jesus win? Well, we're here today as a testimony to the power of Christ over the enemies of the truth. We are gathered here today because of faithful men who have gone forth proclaiming Jesus Christ. And a church which believed the promises of Isaiah 54 that believe the promises of the kingdom parables of the gospel of Matthew, who believe what Jesus told the disciples. Because remember what he says there in the Great Commission. Does he send them out kind of on their own to just kind of do stuff? What does it say? I will go with you. And if the Lord Jesus Christ is going with us, what can stand in our way? What can stop us? as we go out and proclaim Christ. But again, this goes back to something that Isaiah was dealing with, and we'll close on this point. Was Israel living as they believed these things? Did their lives show forth, not only just their thanksgivings for God's covenantal promises, but were they living as those who believed that their God was more powerful than the gods of the nations? Well, of course, the answer to that is no. What did the Israelites and the men and women of Judah do when they needed something? Did they go to God in prayer? No, they went to the gods of Philistia and the gods of the nations surrounding them. And what was the consequence of that? The nation no longer spread to the area that God had promised in the days of Solomon. It continued to get smaller and smaller and smaller. It continued to be destroyed by enemies. And again, God brought this judgment down upon Israel and Judah because they failed to believe the promises of God. And brothers and sisters, that's one of the reasons why the church is in its place today. Because we have failed to believe that our God is God. That our God is the God who is going to bring these things to pass. Again, the weakness of our faith, the weakness of our testimony, the weakness of our holiness is why we see the church continue to shrink and to shrink in our day. 
So what's it going to take for us to see with eyes of faith in the midst of these things? Well, again, remember what Isaiah has told us here. Sing, O barren, you who have not born. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. And he's not talking here literally about singing. What he's meaning here is that everything in our person exclaims Jesus Christ. We love his word. We love his law. We love everything that he has done. And so brothers and sisters, as we again close our time together today, again, this is a question we need to ask ourselves. Do we walk by faith or do we walk by sight? Do we walk by the promises of God or do we walk in fear of this present evil world? Well, again, what can this world do to us? This world can do nothing to us. This world, at best, can kill us. But who are we to fear? We're not to fear that man who can kill the body. We are to fear that one who can kill body and soul. That one who has drawn us out of barrenness and into the fruit of his gospel grace. We are to rest and trust alone in the very word that God has given to his church. We are to expand our tents to the east and to the west, knowing that God will fill us with his people. And let us go in faith and in love for our God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give thanks that you are this God who has promised to us uh, the reality of your truth. That you have promised uh, that we will see men and women come to faith. But dear God, we confess our own sin in the midst of these things. Dear God, that we uh, so often not only just tolerate sin, but that we uh, see sin and we say nothing. We allow wickedness to go on and on and on. But dear God, we pray as those who recognize their own barrenness. God, that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would remind us of your grace, and that you would grow us in our steadfastness in your word. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let us stand now as we sing our closing Bible song, Bible song number 17, I Will Joy. Let us stand and sing together.
and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen.